through the review process for combined stresses, which will also bring into um, <clears throat> view how you should be uh, doing the analysis in order to find a life if life is not infinite. So first let me take a look at that and then I'll go through combined loading summary. Oh, let me use a black one here. Shows much better. So, um, let's say our failure criterion is the Goodman. You find the value of uh, the endurance limit by finding SC prime, applying the modifying factors, and coming up with SC. Let's say SE falls there. You connect from that point to SUT, and that's the Goodman line. The Goodman line indicates the existence of infinite life, meaning that when you calculate your stresses, sigma m and sigma a and all of that, and you plot them, let's say they fall in here. And I'll mark this as infinite life, 10 to the 6. So do we have infinite life in this case, with point plotted where it is? Yes. And we have that with some sort of a factor of safety. In order to find the factor of safety, you draw the load line. So if this point is marked as A, that's O. This is B. The factor of safety N is equal to OB over OA. And it is also equal to SM over sigma M or SA over sigma A. What is the relationship between, for example, SM and sigma M? SM is found by finding the coordinates of the cross section of the load line and the strength line. So how is that related to sigma M? Uh, I'm sorry? Um, well, yes, the constant of proportionality, of course, is that. Yes, that's true. But, uh, but physically, what is the significance? What is the significance of SM? What does that mean? Failure, failure yes. Well, actually, we don't want to say failure. We say lack of infinite life rather than failure. SM and SA are maximum values of sigma A and sigma M so that you will still retain an infinite life. 
so that the part will still have infinite life. Remember, this line designates infinite life. If the point falls inside of this line, there is infinite life. If the point falls outside of that line, there is no infinite life. Therefore, I can increase these two values until they become equal to SA and SM, meaning that I can increase them by the factor of safety, and still have the part last an infinite number of cycles, or 10 to the 6 number of cycles. That's the relationship between those two. <coughs> what if I'm not interested in infinite life? Say for a life of 10 to the 5. Then what do we do? How does this diagram change? Come again, please. SF for a life of 10 to the 5. In other words, graphically, remember how we drew this, and I'll show you that on the uh, screen as well. Graphically, that's 10 to the 6. That's 10 to the 3. This is your stress. That's FSUT, if you recall. And now <coughs> we call that actually SF. If I want a life of 10 to the 5, I go over here and find this SF for 10 to the 5. And put that over here. And clearly, as you can see here, that number is larger than SE. That's SE. Therefore, it will fall. Let's say here, SF, and I'll draw this from here to SUT. This is for a life of 10 to the 5. If my point plots below this line, there is at least a life of 10 to the 5. If it plots beyond that line, there is no life of 10 to the 5. Now let's say I plot my point, and it falls here. right in between those two. That means with that set of stresses, and I don't want to draw the line because it makes this too crowded. With this set of stresses, sigma m and sigma a, what sort of life should I be expecting? Not an exact number, but what, what is the range of the life of the part? That's right. That's right. Somewhere between 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 6. Now, the question is, what is that life? Not just between 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 6, but is it 400,000? Is it 500,000? Is it 200,000? What is it? So graphically, what we do is this. We essentially connect from here to here, go up until we find that, use that to find the life. Because remember, this SF for 10 to the 5 comes from this equation. Right? With n equal to 10 to the 5. Now I'll be doing the reverse of that. I will connect these two. I'll draw another diagram there. It's bigger. Connect these two. Wherever it crosses here, that's my SF for whatever this life is, somewhere between 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 6. Then put it over here and calculate the life. So this would be N 10 to the 5. That would be SF 10 to the 5. Or for any other number of cycles that you want. 
Uh, actually, the best thing is to show you this on the screen with this um, slide that we had before. Oh, do need to turn it on. We drew the Goodman diagram from the SN diagram. That's the SN diagram. <clears throat> we drew the Goodman diagram by saying that here's infinite life. There is the value of SE. Come down here. Put that over here. Connect it to SUT. And you find this. If I want 10 to the 5, 10 to the 5, up, over. Come down here, put it over here, connect to SUT, and I'll get that. And so on. Therefore, it follows that if I go backwards on this, in other words, <clears throat> I have a point here, I connect from here to that point, continue until I get here, and then go back up here and over, I'll get the number of cycles. That's doing it graphically. We'll do it analytically. So graphically, it will look like this. Oh, sorry, that's not FSUT, that's sigma A. Oh, no, that's, that's FSUT. So down in here. So here is my Goodman line, constructed with SE. And now if the point falls here, I connect from the tensile strength to that point, continue until it crosses that line. This is SF, whatever, whatever number of cycles this thing will last. That's SF, and then I'll <clears throat> Take this SF, go up in here, over, and the number of cycles. If you draw all of this to scale, you can actually do this and get a good value for n. However, since that obsessor is in logarithmic form, uh, it's very difficult to read accurately. So you shouldn't be depending on that. That's good for instructional purposes. But we will do that in and uh, we'll do that analytically. And I will now combine that with the procedure that we went over last time for combined loading. So in combined loading, we can have a bending moment, a torque, and an axial load. These are the three components of combined loading. So let's say these are our values. The torque varies from T1 to T2. Bending moment varies from M1 to M2. And axial load varies from F1 to F2. 
And remember that we have made the assumption that all of these are in phase. In other words, they're all maximum at the same time, they're all minimum at the same time. All of them are in phase. Now, having a minimum and a maximum torque, we can calculate a mean and alternating value for the torque. Is everybody OK with that? All right. So we'll use this to go TA and TM. Similarly, we can calculate MA and M and FA and FM. Any part of this that you don't understand, please let me know and let me go over it until you do understand. Because this, um, along with the example problem that we're going to be doing pretty soon, uh, in a few minutes, is something you should be able to do. So if there's anything you don't understand, please let me know. Calculating the TA and TM for all of these allows us to go one step further. From these, calculate a sigma A and a sigma M. Correct? TC over J. Oh, sorry. Uh, for torque, I shouldn't say sigma. I should say tau. TC over J. For moment, sigma bending alternating, sigma bending mean. For axial load, sigma axial alternating, sigma axial mean. The, we will go through an example and calculate all of this. Of course, not all of them will be non-zero in that example. Everything OK so far? All right. Then we combine these three into a sigma a prime. Von Mises stress, and combine these three into a sigma m prime. Mean and alternating values of the von Mises stress. So here's what we have done. We have turned an essentially complicated state of stress where we have torsion, bending, and axial load, and represented that loading with a mean and an alternating value, just as though it were a simple bending problem. So all of that is represented by these two. Now we plot these two over here. And this becomes our sigma a and sigma m, become those sigma a prime and sigma m prime. So everything is turned into these two stresses. So we plot them. For example, we plot it here. Where is my loading point? There's a factor of safety with respect to infinite life. And we find that factor of safety by using the equations that we have up here. Any questions? OK. Let me uh, take a look at this and make sure that I haven't left anything out. No, that looks good. Are you all comfortable with going from this to that to that? Because the first part is just static. It's OK with everybody? All right. Let's take a look at the example problem then.
This example problem is in your handout. This was taken from another book uh, by Juvenile and Marshak. Uh, it says figure 828. Figure 828 is the figure you're looking at. Pertains to the shaft of a disc sander that is made of steel having SU equal to 900 MPa. SU here is the tensile strength. And SY equal to 750 MPa. The most severe loading occurs when an object is held near the periphery of the disc, 100 millimeter radius, with sufficient force to develop a friction torque of 12 newton meters, which approaches the stall torque of the motor. Uh, first, let me say a few words about what we just read. So here you have this, this sander. You've seen all of that. Uh, little shaft here that rotates the sander. You hold an object, in this case near the periphery, and as the sander rotates, it grinds the object, sands the object. With what force? What force creates the sanding operation? When you use a sandpaper, what force do you use to sand? Friction. Friction, which is the same thing, except that it's not manual. So friction force. So if we look at the uh, disk itself, there's a friction force like that, where you hold the object. That's what produces the sanding operation. That force is the force that you apply with the part in your hand. You push it against the disc with some force. That's that force. We call that the normal force. It is the force that creates that friction force. In this case, called FT, a tangential force. And it says that we uh, hold this until the torque that is generated by the friction force is 12 newton meters. Notice that if you apply a force like that to you apply that force FT that generates a torque here. FT times this distance which in this case is 100 millimeters. That torque must be resisted by the shaft. In other words, this shaft sees that torque. And also it says, which approaches the stall torque of the motor. What is the meaning of stall torque? When we say an engine stalls, that means Not going to go any further. It's, it, it, it doesn't die, but it reaches its maximum capacity. You can have, we can get one of these sanders and just push, push, and push, and there will come a time where this torque is going to be so high that the motor can't create that torque. And the motor basically stops. It's called the stall torque. This is different. You, know, you may have heard some stall uh, talking about stalling um, insofar as aircraft is concerned. That's a different type of stall. So aircraft needs, uh, an aircraft needs enough speed in order to stay afloat. And if, you, if it doesn't have enough speed, basically it starts to go down like this with, ta with its tail. And then bring it back, of course, you have to bring down the nose. Uh, pick up speed, and then you'll be fine. But if you don't, of course, it'll crash. This business of going from uh, a horizontal flight, let's say, to a tail down 
going towards the air flight is called stalling of the airplane. But this is different from that. So <clears throat> that's the torque that we have. They tell you that so you can calculate the uh, forces that are creating stresses here. Assume a coefficient of friction of 0.6 between the object and the disk. What is the safety factor with respect to eventual fatigue failure of the shaft? And then they have summarized the uh, statement of the problem here. Notice that also uh, we also have some dimensions given here insofar as these radii are concerned. And uh, those are there for you to be able to calculate uh, stress concentration factors. This is a very short beam, 50 millimeters, very short, but that big. And your bending equations, mc over i, my over i, are really not applicable here. But we're going to use them just for demonstration purposes. You need much more accurate numbers than the ones that I'll be calculating right now. But for our purposes, this will do the job in order for you to understand how to solve such problems. Uh, so, what kind of loads is this shaft under? Remember by loads I mean torque, bending moment, and axial load. Is the shaft under any axial load? That axial load has to be taken up by something, and that's by the shaft itself. So you bring that load down over here. That'll be an axial load in the shaft. And of course, with it, you have to bring in the moment that it generates. And that moment is that normal force times that distance, which is 100 millimeters. So bringing that force down to the center of the shaft creates a moment in the vertical plane, in this case. Moment in the vertical plane. Aside from that, you have this force. You have to bring that down over here. Well, you bring that down. With it, you have to bring its moment. So you end up with a force like this, F sub t. And it generates this moment 100 times F sub t. Agreed? That's that moment. So when you bring this force down and put it at the center of the shaft here, back in here is going to generate a bending moment. In other words, it's like this. Assuming that end is fixed, the end that's connected to the motor, you have a force that acts like this. Should draw it in the X like that. So that's going to generate a bending moment here. That bending moment is in the horizontal plane. Bending moment due to this in the vertical plane, bending moment due to that in the horizontal plane. So your beam is under two bending moments, if we may draw its um, cross section. Well, actually, let me do it 90 degrees so it, it will look like the picture. 90 degrees off. So <clears throat> we have uh, at that, we have this. This is that section right there. So we have an axial load. We've called it Fn, which is the same as the normal force. We have a bending moment 
in the horizontal plane, like this. And we also have a bending moment in the vertical plane. And we also have a torque. So that's sum total of all of these forces on that cross-sectional area. The um, directions, you take a look, they may or may not be correct with my axes. But those are the, generate, those are the forces or loads that are generated. So now we combine these two bending moments to get a single bending moment. We've done this before. We did it actually in an example problem, the very beginning of the class, where we were reviewing 218 and 219. Something very similar that, uh, to that was drawn. So we will have, from these two, we will have one bending moment, one torque, and one axial load. Shear load we neglect as usual. Even though in this case it's substantial because the beam is very short. So we need to calculate um, the stresses that are created by these loads. Uh, for fatigue purposes, we're making this assumption that Ka times Kb times Kc, all of the modifying factors, if you multiply them together, you get that number 0.648. And that is uh, not arbitrary. Actually, it's calculated to be that number. But just to uh, save time in uh, doing the problem, we assume that's the case. And I may do this in quizzes or exams, uh, tell you to assume the product of all correction factors, for example, to be 0.6. So don't go calculating modifying factors or correction factors if that's the case. So, a torque of 12 newton meters, a torque of 12 newton meters results in a tangential force of 120 newtons. 120 newtons multiplied by 100 millimeters is 12,000 millimeters or 12 newton meters, which is the stall torque of the motor. So the tangential force is found by dividing the moment by 100, so 120 newtons. That tangential force comes from friction, which is generated between the two parts via the normal force, Fn. So what kind of normal force do I need with a coefficient of friction of 0.6 to calculate this friction force? The tangential force is essentially the friction force. So divide 120 by 0.6 and you get 200 newtons. Summary of loading, 12 newton meter torque, 200 newtons axial load, bending in the horizontal plane 120 times 50 millimeters. That's due to the uh, tangential force and 200 times 100 millimeters due to the normal force. So these are generated by these two. There's the moment arm <coughs> for the tangential force. There's the moment arm for the normal force. Two bendings in two different directions. They are then combined to give you one bending moment. 20.9 newton meters. Also from the geometry, you should calculate. Um, so this is the total bending moment. From the geometry, you should calculate the stress concentration factors. And notice that even though the discontinuity is the same, the stress concentration factor for torsion, bending, and axial load will not be the same. So each of them has to be calculated separately. You need all of these ratios, 
which are the results of the dimensions that are given, to find the geometric stress concentration factor from the graphs on Appendix A15 in your book. So that's where these come from. And I'll leave it up to you to verify that they are correct. Since we are doing a fatigue analysis, uh, what we need to do is convert these geometric stress concentration factors to fatigue stress concentration factors. And to do that, we need the notch sensitivity. These are values of notch sensitivity for axial loading and bending. That's, those are normal stresses, so they're both the same. And then notch sensitivity for torsion is approximately equal to 1. Here are values of the hardness value is also calculated in order to use figure 621. So the fatigue stress concentration factors are calculated using the equation that we have. This equation, Kf equals 1 plus Q times Kt minus 1. It slightly reduces the stress concentration factor. So 1.3 for axial, 1.2 for bending, 1.1 for torsion. Now, calculation of stresses. So over here, we calculated the uh, loads. Now let's go from that to stresses. In other words, we're now over here in this summary. We're starting with the T1 and the T2, M1 and M2, F1 and F2. So what are the values of the T1 and T2? How does the torque change in the shaft when you're holding this against the sander? Does it change? Where does the torque come from? What force? Friction. So if I'm holding this against the sander, what happens to the friction force? Does it change? Assume that I'm applying the same normal force. If I'm applying the same normal force, the friction force doesn't change because it's that normal force multiplied by coefficient of friction. And if the friction force doesn't change, nor will the torque. So essentially, T1 is equal to T2. So there is no alternating value of the torque. Because remember how we calculate that. It's T max minus T min divided by 2. If T max and T min are equal, then there is no alternating. Ta equals zero. There is a mean torque, and that, of course, is equal to the torque itself, because it's equal to Ta T max plus T min divided by two, and T max and T min are equal. So that's the mean and alternating value of the torque. Axial load, same thing. Remember that the torque actually comes from the axial load, which generates the friction force. So if I'm not changing the axial load, there is no alternating value of the axial load, only a mean value of 200 newtons. And finally, bending. Is the bending moment a constant or not? The bending moment that we calculated, 20.9 newton meters. Again, envision what I'm doing. I'm holding this against the sander, and the sander is rotating. And I'm generating a bending moment in the shaft of the sander. Does that bending moment change? Where does the bending moment come from? Come again, please. 
the force that I apply plus the force that is generated from the force that I apply. In other words, from Fn, the force that I apply, and Ft, that's generated via friction. So if I'm holding this with a constant force of 200 newtons, do those forces change? No, they don't change. The bending moment is a constant, but the shaft is rotating. So it's very similar to the rotating beam specimen. The bending moment is a constant, doesn't change, but the shaft changes. Sorry, the shaft rotates and therefore the stresses change. So even though the bending moment does not change, we say that we will calculate an alternating value for this bending moment as though it were changing, as though it were going like this. But it doesn't. The shaft rotates. So the points that's in compression goes to tension, compression, tension, and all of that. So for that purpose, we call this MA. Not that there really is an MA. Using these and the equations that you know, and of course the stress concentration values, fatigue stress concentrations, we calculate the uh, stresses. The shear stress, 16t divided by pi d cubed. Remember that you can only use these equations, all three of them that I have here, if the shaft is solid. Otherwise, you have to use the old equations that you know, mc over i, tc over j, f over a, and all of those. So we get a mean shear stress, no alternating shear stress. We get a mean axial stress, that's a mean axial stress, which is negative, of course, because it's compression. The shaft is in compression. No, no alternating component of the axial stress. And finally, we get an alternating component of the bending moment, but no mean component of the bending moment. Mean component is zero. So now we're over here. We've calculated mean and alternating values of all of these stresses. So we combine these three and combine those three to get sigma m prime and sigma a prime. Sigma m prime, sigma a prime, and all of these are here. So for sigma m prime, for mean, we have a shear stress and a normal compressive stress. And this is von Mises' equation for the case that we have, which is this case. You have one normal stress and one shear stress. For that, von Mises' stress is equal to sigma squared plus 3 tau squared. Using that allows me to calculate the von Mises stress without finding the principal stresses. So any time you can do that, that's fine. But remember that it only applies to that stress situation. One normal stress, one shear stress. Ah, I should put a tau here too. So, Mean von Mises stress, alternating von Mises stress. We only have one component, that's a sigma, so it comes out to be equal to sigma. Once you have calculated the stresses, and before you go into fatigue analysis, uh, <clears throat> calculate the static factor of safety to make sure that the part is not yielding under these stresses. And to do that, do not use an equation like this. Don't add these two values that we've just found and call them sigma prime. They are not equal to the static von Mises stress. Uh, and I can, you, you'll see it here, of course, that they're not the same. 
And I can also show you why not. So don't add those two and call them the von Mises stress. Instead, just do exactly what you were doing before we did any fatigue. Calculate the von Mises stress the way you did it before. You have a bending moment, you have an axial load, you have a torque, take all of those maximum values, calculate a normal stress, calculate a shear stress, and calculate von Mises. And that's like this. The normal stress is composed of two parts. This normal stress is composed of two parts. A bending part and an axial load part. Notice that the axial load is negative. The bending is either negative or positive depending which side of the shaft you're looking at. Are you looking at the top or at the bottom? Since yielding is independent of tensile or compressive forces, in other words, when you put something in tension, it yields at some value of the force, it will yield at the same value of the force that you put it in compression. Doesn't matter. We should be you adding the two. So we will use the, comp it's actually a compressive stress here that's added to 1.3 compressive stress that we, ca we found for axial load. So sigma squared plus 3 tau squared, and that's the value of tau, <coughs> and sigma prime becomes equal to 69.7 MPa. Notice that if you add those two, you get about 90.8 MPa, much different from that. So sigma prime is not equal to sigma M prime plus sigma A prime. Having that and the yield strength of the material, we find a factor of safety, in this case 10.7. This is not uncommon. In fatigue problems, static factors of safety are generally high. Because what governs the design, not static loading, is fatigue loading. So for static, it's uh, generally high. I, I don't mean if you find a factor of safety of 150 not to question it. By all means, question it. But if you find something like 5 or 10 or 12, that's normal. That's not outside of the uh, range. Now that there's no yielding, we do fatigue. And I'm going to go over time a little bit here and then give you uh, your break. So in order to do that, we need SE. SE prime is 0.5 SUT, never mind that 0.6. It's left over from previous edition of the book. Just use 0.5 SUT, 455. Product of all correction factors given, 295 MPa. That's our SE. So there it is, 295. Draw the line to SUT. That's the Goodman line. The load line, there's your sigma M, there's your sigma A, there's the slope of the load line. Sigma A over sigma M. Or the equation of the load line is sigma A equals 2.2 sigma M equals SA equals 2.2 uh, SM, all the same. Remember that the ratio of these two is the same as the ratio of those two. These are just the limiting values of those two. And that's what we have here. And you solve the equations with SM to find the point of intersection. So there's the equation of the load line, and here down below is the equation of the Goodman line, written slightly in a different manner than I used it, used in the uh, previous example. Uh, SA, the value here, is equal to the intercept, 295, minus the slope, 295 over 900, times SM. So there it is. And we substitute now for SM from here, SA over 2.2, and solve for SA, 257. Factor of safety is SA over sigma A, this equation. Or SM over sigma M, whichever you like, doesn't matter. <clears throat> 4.1. 
factor of safety for fatigue. So this is okay for infinite life. Now to, to illustrate what you do if there is no infinite life. But before we do that, do you have any questions? Okay, now read this part. It says, and now assume that the stresses were sigma a prime equals sigma m prime equals 260. This is just a number that I've taken to make sure that there is no infinite life. That the point falls now over here somewhere. How do we find the life of the part? So I'm out here, just like this one. Now we're going to do this. This procedure that I talked about, we're going to do over there, analytically. So <clears throat> we plot the two stresses, sigma a prime and sigma m prime. This case, me, in this case, both of them are uh, equal to 260. There's the point, both equal to 260, right there. We connect from SUT to that point until it crosses that line. That's our SF. That brings us over here or over here. Same thing. We write an equation for that line in terms of SF. So what is that equation? That sigma A, the alternating stress, is equal to the intercept SF minus the slope SF over 900 times sigma m. That line is passing through point B. Therefore, the coordinates of point B must fit the equation of that line. So you substitute sigma A equals sigma m equals 260 and solve for SF. Once you solve for SF, you're over here. And you use your equation a n to the b to find the life. And that's done at the bottom of page 22. So we find sf equals 360. This is 366, sorry. We assume, I assume f equals 0.9. f is what you calculate a and b with. A and B are the two uh, constants. Then F, N equals SF over A to the 1 over B. You get 233,000 cycles. So that's how you solve these problems, whether there's a factor of safety or a finite life. Any questions? As I said, this is the type of problem that you should be able to do. Of course, it is long and drawn out, no question. So in many cases, I will give you some of the values uh, to make sure that it doesn't take too long. But I will uh, test your understanding of uh, the concepts. OK, let's take a break. And please come in here and pick up your homework problems. One of the questions that is uh, often asked is, what happens if you load a material um, to an endurance, to a stress larger than its endurance limit? Uh, clearly, it will not have infinite life. But it might have a life of, say, 500,000 cycles. Not a million, 500,000. So what if then, after that, we subject it to another stress, also larger than SE? How many cycles of this larger stress will it take? In other words, we're now changing the value of the stress. A few cycles of one stress a few cycles of another stress, a few cycles of a third stress. The question is, how many cycles of a fourth stress? How do you find that? A, an equation that has been suggested looks like this. n1 over n1. I'll explain what these are.
where n1 little n1 is the number of cycles of a stress called sigma 1 that you apply. So you apply sigma 1 for n1. Then you apply sigma 2 for n2. And so on. And the question is, if I apply a, let's just put some dots here, sigma n, and n equals what? So, given stress, given number of cycles, given stress, given number of cycles, and so on, and then we go in here, after a number of cycles of some of these stresses, we say, now if I come, it's still alive, it's still not broken. If I put in this stress, how many cycles of that stress will it take? Does everybody understand what the problem is first? So we have applied a number of stresses, all of them larger than SE, for some numbers of cycles, and we would like to know how much life remains for another stress N. These big ends these are life of the part at these stresses. So you apply sigma 1 for N1, but it's like actually is N1. So if this is 600,000, this might be 100,000. N2 is the life of the part at sigma 2, and so on. So here we want to find n sub n. These two are equal, actually, at the very end. Again, results of experiments show that an equation similar to this is viable. The sum of all these ratios equal to c. So we usually write this as the summation of ni over ni equals c. And the value of c is found to be somewhere between 0.7 and 2.2, and usually taken as 1. So we get summation of ni over ni equals 1. One of the reasons that it's taken equal to 1, of course, number 1, it is between those two extremes. Uh, number two, if you only have one stress, just that, and the question is, how many cycles of that stress can I apply? In other words, what should little n1 be equal to before any failure occurs? Well, clearly it should be equal to n1. Therefore, a number one makes sense. This is not to say that this is very accurate, but it does make sense. Uh, so if you have a problem like this, how do we approach this problem? Uh, although I don't go over example problems in the book, in this case I will, because the example problem that's given is very instructive. So consider this, and the uh, SN diagram is on the screen. The solid line shows the SN diagram for some steel. Endurance limit, 40, KSI, FSUT, 72, and so on. According to that SN diagram, the solid line, if I apply a stress of 60 KSI, this should have a life of whatever that is, and you can calculate that using your equation that you have. and just put in 60 KSI there with A and B and find that value. Comes out to be this number, 8,520 cycles. Means that if you apply 60 KSI to this, it'll take something around 8,500 cycles before any failure occurs. Okay. 
let's say rather than loading it with that many cycles, we load it with 3,000 cycles. So this can take approximately 8,500 cycles. We load it with 3,000 cycles of that very same stress, 60 KSI. So the life of this part, oh, I should say what N1, and in this case then, your N1 is 8,520 cycles. Your N1 is 3,000 cycles. OK? So how much of the life of the part is left at this very stress. This is for 60 KSI. How much of the life is left? Oh. Yeah, 5,520. Correct? Just subtract those two from one another. That's how much life is left. And notice that 60 KSI, of course, is larger than the inverse limit. So this material has been damaged. In other words, if we continue to do this, it will fail. Some crack has developed, and it has somewhat propagated through a material. It has not led to failure yet, fracture that has developed and has propagated. Therefore, the SN diagram for this damaged material is no longer that solid line. It's a dashed line. And we already have one point on that dashed line. That's this. I can still say I can put 60 KSI for that many cycles. That's the number of cycles that's left. So that gives me this point. at 5,520 and 60 KSI. If I can find another point, then I can connect those two points and have the new SN line. For the next point, we use this equation. Rather than saying that many cycles of 60 KSI is left, I will ask this question. If I load this with the original endurance limit, 40 KSI in this case, <coughs> how many cycles will it take? We use that equation. And remember, the original endurance limit under SE, this will take 10 to the 6 cycles, right? That's the meaning of SE, 10 to the 6 cycles. So I say, all right, I have this. I've used 3,000 of 8,520. How many cycles of a stress that originally would be taken for 10 to the 6 cycles are left? Everybody following this? How many cycles of the original Endurance limit stress is left. We solve for N1. Oh, sorry, do not call it N1. Um, call it N2. And that turns out to be 648,000 cycles. In other words, the material is no longer capable of taking the original endurance limit for an infinite number of cycles. But we knew that already, because it has been damaged. So the original endurance limit, 40. Number of cycles that's left this, that gives me in my next point, which is over there, 40 and 648,000. So I have two points on the damaged material SN diagram. I connect them, and this becomes the SN line. To find the new endurance limit, the endurance limit of the damaged material, 
I just simply continue that until it crosses the 10 to the 6 line, because that's the meaning of it. Endurance limit is the stress that should be taken 10 to the 6 cycles. Wherever that crosses, that's my new endurance limit. And of course, you can, once you draw the equation, well, sorry, once you write the equation of this line, you just put in 10 to the 6 for n and find this value, 38.6. Any questions? There are two issues with this method. One, is that it appears as though it says the tensile strength of the material has decreased. That was 0.9 SUT, undamaged material, 0.9 SUT of the new material, the damaged material. And this is not borne by experimental results. We just don't see that, that the tensile strength has changed. That's one problem. The other problem is that this equation is used without any history of loading. What do I mean by that? Uh, we say that for stresses higher than the endurance limit. Well, originally, that's the endurance limit of the material. So, and 60, of course, is higher than that. But Notice what happens. When I do this and I put in 60, uh, 3 thousandths of 60 KSI, the endurance limit is no longer 40. It's 38.6. Correct? Now, if I there's your 40 and there's 38.6. Thirty-eight point six. What if first I put in three thousand cycles of sixty ksi, then I come in and I put in this stress somewhere between thirty-eight point six and forty? Yes, it is smaller than forty, but forty is no longer our endurance limit. It's larger than that. This doesn't do that. This says. All stresses have to be larger than the original endurance limit, SE40. So these are two problems. Uh, to eliminate both of these problems, uh, this is called uh, Miner's Rule, I think. Uh, there's another one called Manson's Rule, and that actually makes the procedure simpler as well. Once we find this, point, we calculated 5,520 and 60 KSI, we know that the tensile strength doesn't change by experimental values. We just connect from that point to that point, continue until it crosses 10 to the 6 line. We call this the new endurance limit of the material, 34.4. That way we don't have to worry about this business of the endurance limit and all of that being changed and not being considered here. OK? So that's essentially what we do. Any questions? OK? That wraps up fatigue. And so now we will start on threaded fastener.
as the name implies, of course, uh, threaded fasteners are fasteners that join two parts via a screw or a bolt and a nut, as opposed to, for example, a rivet or a welded joint or something like that. There are some nomenclatures that go with threaded fasteners. Uh, you have had all of this in 233, so I'll just go over it relatively quickly here. Major diameter is the diameter of the part of which the fastener is cut or rolled. Uh, you, can, you can produce these either by a rolling process, which is a plastic deformation process, or by a cutting process. Cut the actual threads into the uh, rod. That is going to be your screw or bolt. Uh, <clears throat> so that's called the major diameter. Minor diameter is the diameter of the roots of the threads, also called the root diameter. There's a diameter called the pitch diameter, which is used often. Um, it's not the average, but it's somewhere between the root diameter and major diameter, minimum diameter and ma maximum diameter. Uh, the, rest of, the rest of this, oh, pitch, I need to say something about that. The rest of these are nomenclatures that you are familiar with. Pitch is the distance between respective points of two adjacent threads. So from apex to apex, from root to root, respective points. And if the fastener has a single pitch, a single pitch fastener, is also the distance, well, in general, it is also the distance but sometimes it's double that, sometimes triple that. The distance that the part moves on the fastener due to one revolution. So if you have a pitch of, say, two millimeters, that means the rotation of a nut, the complete rotation of a nut on the bolt will move the nut two millimeters. That's called the pitch. You have single pitch such that that movement is equal to one pitch. Single pitch is cut like this. Here's a cutter. And you just simply move this forward as it rotates. As it moves forward and rotates, the cutter cuts a helix on this, like that. Those are your threads. If you have a single cutter, then the distance that a nut, let's say, move on this, moves on this bolt due to one revolution is equal to the pitch due to one revolution. It's also called the lead. The lead is the distance the part moves due to one revolution. If you have a double cutter, like that, then you cut two threads at the same time. And then when you rotate the knot, rather than moving a distance equal to one pitch, moves a distance equal to two pitches. In other words, moves forward faster. Called single pitch, double pitch, triple pitch, so on and so forth. Uh, so in that case, the lead would be two times the pitch, for example. So that's the difference between the lead and the pitch. The lead is how much it moves horizontally, and the pitch is the distance between adjacent threads. Um, designation in the U.S. customary system looks something like this. The first number, 
indicates the major diameter. The next number number of pitches per inch. And the last one tells you that this is unified thread, which is the thread in the, in the um, US customary sy uh, system. F means fine series. You can cut these as fine or coarse. And uh, this pitch must al may also be equal to uh, the lead, or oh, sorry, the threads. Actually, I should cut that rather than pitches. Yeah, turns out the same thing. Should change change that to threads per inch, although they would be the same as threads per inch. Although they would be the same in single threaded, might produce confusion if it's not single threaded. You may see this nomenclature. Mm, rather than UNF, you may see UNRF. That means there's a root radius. When the uh, thread is cut, as you see there, it's cut like this. There's a lot of stress concentration here. So to avoid that, make a little radius there. You reduce the stress concentration factor. And if that's the case, then the R will appear there in the nomenclature. This is very useful for, for uh, fatigue analysis or fatigue purposes. This is in the US customary system. In the metric system, the nomenclature starts with M, meaning metric, then a uh, number, and for an M12, uh, the pitch is 1.75. So that means metric. That's major diameter. And that's the pitch, all in millimeters. That's in the two uh, systems. When we use threaded fasteners and when you tighten threaded fasteners, the bolt or the fastener is under axial load if you're pressing two parts together. Does that make sense to everyone? You tighten it, the bolt is actor, uh, under axial load. So if you're going to calculate the axial stress, you will use sigma equals p over a, for example. The question becomes, what do you use for a? Do you use this diameter? Do you use that diameter? Or do you use some diameter in between? The answer is you use some diameter in between whose area is called the tensile stress area. So it's somewhere between the area of the major diameter, area of root diameter. Um, Tensile stress area is given for various uh, threaded fasteners. Uh, I guess we're done with that. Uh, this, this other uh, slide here shows some relationship between the uh, dimensions in a threaded uh, fastener. So just simply take a look at that. But here is the uh, table, table 8.1. This is for the metric system, and it gives you the tensile stress area. 
So whenever you, you're making calculations, don't calculate pi d squared over 4, but go to the tensile stress area, and depending on the diameter, major diameter or nominal diameter that you have, pick off the tensile stress area and use it as is, called a t, a sub t. Uh, another table, is it also in your book, for the U.S. customary or UNF or UN series, not necessarily F. I think there's one for coarse and one for fine. Uh, you pick off the tensile stress areas there as well. So these are some of the things that uh, you went over in ME233. Uh, now we would like to take a look at power screws. As the name implies, power screws are screws that transmit power. Uh, the picture that you're looking at on the screen is very similar to the tensile testing machine that we have in the strength lab. You, when you were there, you saw these old machines, and they, that's what they look like. Uh, the new one is essentially the same thing, except that these columns, which are, which are called power screws, uh, are covered. So it's difficult for you to see them. This is not covered, and you can see it clearly. They are created with um, threads uh, called either square threads or Acme threads. And here, let me show you a picture of square and Acme, and then we'll come back to this. Threads are square, like the one on the left, or Acme, like the one on the right. The Acme thread is cut at an angle. The square thread is cut perpendicular to the axis of the uh, bolt or screw. Now, this power screw transmit, transmits a torque generated by the motor and transferred through this gear system <coughs> to these. That torque essentially rotates these very slowly. And as you can see, both of these gears are being driven by that gear. And therefore, and they have the same diameter, of course. Therefore, they both turn at the same speed. Rotational speed is the same in the two. When these two turn, it makes this, which is called the moving head of the testing machine, move up or down depending on whether they rotate clockwise or counterclockwise. The part that you want to test, you put over here. You secure it between these two. Then if you want to test it in tension, you turn the machine on and have the moving head go up. If you want it in compression, moving head will come down, will give you tension or compression. So a torque now has been transmitted to essentially a force. What we would like to do is find the relationship between the force that is generated here, which of course is generated there and there as well, because of equilibrium of this head, relate that force to the torque that each of these screws sees as they try to uh, move the head up or down. A screw is similar to what kind of a simple machine? ME233. Do you know any, any examples of simple machines? Lever. Lever, yes. That's an example of a simple machine. What else? A wedge, which is also called 
an inclined plane. It's a simple machine. In other words, it allows you to move a heavy object with a relatively small force some distance up or down as the case may be so that you don't have to apply let's say all of the weight of the body to raise it to some height you can apply a smaller load but it's going to take you a lot longer to get there it's just like going straight up in an elevator or on stairs that's all that is an inclined plane nothing but an inclined plane it's an inclined plane that goes around like that so from here it goes to there it goes to there it goes to there right those are the cross sections of the threads that's nothing but an inclined plane therefore we use the analogy of an inclined plane to find out this relationship between the axial load in the bolt and the torque that is required for that axial load Uh, these are some preferred pitches for Acme threads. These are tables that you will be using for homework and whatnot. Here, oh, here's another power screw. A very primitive one, manual, but nevertheless a power screw. There's a more sophisticated one with a worm gear. And here's our case. We've called this the nut or the load, or the moving head, whatever you want to call it. There's your power screw, the force F there, and you have these forces on the two sides. That's a little uh, too much of a simplification, dividing that force into two, but it's okay. This angle of this helix, lambda, is called the lead angle. The larger that angle, the faster the motion of the nut on the bolt. And of course the other factors that you had, pitch and all, otherwise. So we use the analogy of an inclined plane. And uh, that free body diagram points to nothing. So it really should be drawn like this. Let's say this thing has a weight w equal to f you're trying to push it up the inclined plane so you apply a force called p rays and you have a normal force here and you have to overcome this friction force i call it mu and they call it f and whatever they're both coefficients of friction Let's find out what force require, is required to push this up the incline. And remember that this weight is W, so I'll just turn it into a force like that. So to overcome that friction, you must go just past equilibrium. So go X and Y, summation of forces in the X direction is equal to p raised the force required to raise this this angle is lambda as the lead angle uh, minus mu n cosine lambda and minus n sine lambda summation of forces in the y direction is equal to n cosine lambda minus what do you call it f and minus mu n sine lambda both of these must equal to zero put the lambda over here two equations and two unknowns 
in n and p rays. Remember, this is our load. This is, this is what we want to actually push up the incline. This is the force applied to that head, if you will. So we solve two equations and to eliminate n and solve for PR. And this is what you get. Get PR equals F times sine lambda plus mu cosine lambda divided by cosine lambda minus mu sine lambda. And p lower, f times mu cosine lambda minus sine lambda divided by cosine lambda plus mu sine lambda. That's the P rays. If we want to lower this, we may or may not have to apply a force like that. Maybe it just moves down the incline by itself. Maybe it doesn't. If it doesn't, you have to apply a PL, P to lower the, the load, we say. And that, you can do it by drawing the free body diagram shown on the screen on the right-hand side. That's to lower the load, and all you do is Switch that load to this side, friction force switches, everything else remains the same. And we write equilibrium equations to get this. Uh, now we make this substitution. First, uh, before the substitution, we divide the uh, numerator and denominator of both of these by cosine of lambda. Then, and sub, let's come back here. If this is the lead angle, and if I assume that what I have drawn here is one complete thread, 360 degrees, then that must equal to the lead. That's how much I've raised this on the inclined plane. How much I've raised this by, let's say it's a single pitch thread. By rotating it, one rotation goes up one pitch or one lead if it's not single threaded. So this is L, this can be L, and that's pi dm, one complete circle. And here, I'm using the mean diameter. Mean diameter is this diameter. See on top? Mean diameter. I'm using the mean diameter in order to calculate the circumference of one thread. So, with these, Tangent of lambda is equal to L divided by pi dm. If we do that, if we divide by cosine of lambda, get tangent of lambda there, one there, one there, tangent of lambda there, and so on. Substitute for tangent of lambda. And you get these equations. PR equals F times L divided by pi dm plus mu divided by 1 minus mu L divided by pi dm. And PL to lower 
f times mu minus L over pi dm plus 1 plus mu L divided by pi dm. In the first case, you have to overcome friction and raise the load, both. In the second case, the friction force is actually helping you. You just have to raise the load. See what you need to raise the load. Of course, we don't do this by applying a force like that. There's no way for us to do that. We do it by applying a torque with a wrench. So the question now is, what kind of a load do I need? What kind of a torque do I need in order to be able to develop either one of these two? Well, we then go back to this. And we say all of these loads that we're showing, uh, PR and PL and all of that, they're, we're assuming that they're acting here at the center line, like that. And if you have a load sitting on a thread, it's all around the thread that this force is seen. So this force PR or PL is distributed like that. Sum of all of these is PR or PL, the sum. Therefore, T is equal to PR dm over 2. Torque, force, times the moment arm. And this is dm. And to get this in terms of uh, what we have, rather than PR, the rest of the, we just substitute for PR into that equation, and we'll get this equation. T is equal to F dm over 2 times L plus pi mu dm divided by pi dm minus mu L. This is to raise and to lower F dm over 2 times pi mu dm minus L divided by pi dm plus mu. So that's the torque that you need to generate in each of these power screws to raise a load equal to F. This one overcomes friction and raises the load through a lead angle L. Or lead L. So overcomes friction, raises the load. This one, the friction is actually helping. We just need to raise the load. Only part of it anyway. Part of it is taken care of by friction. Okay? Uh, or not raise, I said raise. I meant lower in the second case. Any questions? Yes, it is. Thank you for mentioning that. Yes, it is. Thanks very much. Yes, please correct that. It, it should be going to the middle. It is the mean diameter where we assume PR is acting. Okay? Um, 
I'll see you on Tuesday. If there is a quiz on Tuesday, it will cover all of fatigue. It can cover anything. From, I won't cover all of it, but it can cover anything in fatigue because we've finished that. Uh, but we'll not include any of this. Have a good weekend. I'll see you on Tuesday. That's yours. <laughs>